Good morning and uh, welcome to our service today. Psalm 100 verse 1 tells us to shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. And we can sing to him the words of Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we <clears throat> come into uh, your presence in this very special manner. Uh, we thank you that we come as worshippers. And when we remind ourselves of who you are, then we have many reasons for worship. We do worship you as our creator, uh, the one who has given to each of us our unique personalities. And we are made in your image, and that is an amazing status to have. We thank you, Lord, that we come to you, the God who has a great plan. Your plan is a plan of salvation, because although we were made in your image, uh, we have turned away from you. But our turning from you has opened up a way for us to discover uh, features of who you are that we would not have known otherwise. And we thank you that you have a great plan of mercy, a great plan of rescue, a great plan to do good to us. We thank you, Lord, that the plan involved uh, you sending your Son into this world. And when he came into this world, he lived a perfect life. 
And we thank you for that life, uh, a life that we can look to as an example, even although we know we can never imitate him fully. But we thank you that his life is more than an example, that he had a perfect life in order to offer it up on the cross as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. And it is amazing to us to realize that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And we come here to give you thanks for that amazing gift that you gave your only Son, not to <clears throat> a pleasant journey through life, but to a life that was going to climax in one sense at the cross, where there you punished him instead of us. And we come, Lord, to worship you for that today, your great plan of mercy. Uh, we thank you, too, that that plan involved <clears throat> not only sending uh, your Son into the world, but also sending the Holy Spirit. And he comes into our lives uh, when we believe in Jesus. And we thank you for the way he works in our lives. And even as we gather here to worship, we realize that we need him to help us to worship. And we pray that we would be experiencing that as we uh, approach your throne and give you praise. We know that we are sinners and it's appropriate for us as we are in your presence to acknowledge that. And we confess to you that we have failed in numerous ways. And indeed the reality is that we have done nothing perfect. Everything that we do is tainted in some degree uh, by our sinfulness. And even our worship this morning has those uh, sinful uh, connections to it, uh, whatever they might be. But we thank you that your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you that we can not only mention our sins as a part of our confession, but we can do so knowing that they, we will be cleansed from their defiling effects upon us, as well as being forgiven by you for them. Lord, we come to you to ask you to <clears throat> work as a God of providence, and we have many reasons for prayer regarding that matter at this time. Uh, we do remember our country as we are going through this crisis connected to the uh, coronavirus. And we pray that you would give our rulers wisdom as they attempt to take us through all this. Uh, we pray that you would uh, give protection uh, to those who are involved in a direct sense and looking after those affected by the virus. And we pray for those in hospital and care homes and in the community who are en engaged in that important activity. And we pray that you would give your protection to all such. Uh, we thank you for <clears throat> the vaccines that have come along. And we do pray that in the weeks and months ahead, we would see the benefits of, him, of them. We ask you, Lord, to <clears throat> show comfort to those who have been uh, adversely affected by the virus. And we know that there are thousands of homes uh, throughout our country where that has been the case, and indeed is the case. And we pray, Lord, that remember those who are bereaved uh, because of the virus, and uh, we ask that you would uh, show mercy to uh, those people today <clears throat> who are grieving, and also remember those in hospital who are still suffering from the effects of the virus. 
Lord, we have other reasons to pray to you regarding our country, and we ask, Lord, that you would remember us in all the various things that go on in life. We thank you that we can commit all our ways to you. You tell us to do that, whether individually or in corporately, and we pray that your blessing would be upon us as a nation in all the various levels of life uh, that exist. Uh, remember us as a church as well in this country. Uh, we need to be revived. That We ask that you would give to us more of your spirit so that we as a church throughout our nation uh, would experience a great power from you, and indeed not only in our nation, but throughout the whole world. Uh, we need to be revived as a church, and we pray that you would do that uh, with your great and gracious power. And remember, too, uh, all the congregations connected to that church. Uh, we pray that every one of them today would know your blessing as they meet together. And we pray that the congregation here in Dingwall and Strathpeffer would also know your blessing and as they uh, prepare for their future, whatever that is, with a new ministry at some stage, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would guide them uh, through all the processes that will lead up to that whenever it occurs. And we, as we pray for your church, uh, we do pray for uh, anyone in the congregation who is uh, hurting at the moment, uh, that you would remember such, those who have been bereaved or who are not well, or any other <clears throat> causes of um, distress or uncertainty, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would remember them all. And we also remember your church throughout the world, and we do pray for your suffering church. Uh, there are many of them uh, being persecuted today, and we ask, Lord, that you would give to all of them a special sense of your presence. We ask you, too, to remember <coughs> the children uh, of our uh, country and in, of our churches and of this congregation, too, at uh, this time that you would help them as they face this uh, very uncertain world in which we are, that you would give to them a special sense that you are there for them to help them, and we ask you to bless them as well. We ask too, Lord, that today there will be many converts to, your, to the church. Um, we realize that we are limited in many things that we can do, but we know that you are not limited. And we pray that the gospel today would bring forth many converts uh, wherever it is declared. There are many other things that we could pray about, and we thank you, Lord, that you know all the desires of our hearts. And we thank you that you're able to answer them all far above what we can ask or imagine. So we ask you, Lord, to do that and to remember us for good, for your own name's sake. Amen. I think sometimes uh, we might imagine that prayer is very difficult, and I, no doubt it is at times. But as I speak to the children, I want to just mention three easy prayers that they can use. Um, prayers don't have to be long, um, and in the Bible there are many short kind of prayers. And I think the three I'm going to mention are very easy to remember. And not only are they easy to remember, but they can be said many times. So that's how uh, we pray to God. Now, the first prayer that I want us to remember is this one, which says, Lord, help me. Maybe you can imagine all kinds of situations 
uh, where you might need help. And you may wonder what to do. And sometimes you may not know what to do. And when that happens, all you need to say to God is, Lord, help me. And the amazing thing is, he hears that. How long does it take to say, Lord, help me? It doesn't even take 10 seconds. And we can say this kind of prayer as often as we want. Lord, help me. Maybe some are going back to school. Lord, help me. Maybe at home. Lord, help me. Maybe out where you're playing. Lord, help me. There are many things, many places where we can say, Lord, help me. And the second one I want us to think about is, Lord, be with me. Again, that doesn't take very long to say. I don't think it takes more than 10 seconds to say, Lord, be with me. The astonishing thing about this kind of prayer is that all of us, all of you, can say it at the same time. And as you say it at the same time, God can be with all of you. But even if you are miles apart, if you all said this prayer at the same time, God would be with all of you. It's hard to understand that, I know, but it's true. And whatever you may be planning for today or for the days in, in this week, you can say, Lord, be with me. And it's easy to say, isn't it? Lord, be with me. And then there's a third easy prayer. And that is one that we can make, or you can make, when you do something that's wrong. And everybody, not just children, but everybody, grown-ups as well, need to say this prayer. Lord, forgive me. When we do something wrong, how long should we wait before we say this easy prayer? The answer is, we should say this prayer immediately. Whenever we do something wrong, even if we think something wrong or say something wrong, the first thing that we should do is say to God, Lord, forgive me. And it doesn't matter how often we have to say this prayer. Every time we say it, God will forgive us. So I think these are three easy prayers. Lord, help me. Lord, be with me. And Lord, forgive me. And here are uh, three examples just for you to think about, or maybe your mom or your dad can help you with them. Lord, help me with my lessons. And Lord, be with me every day. And Lord, forgive me when I do wrong. And I hope these prayers help you as you uh, say them to God. Uh, we're now going to say the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Bible reading today is from Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And may God bless that reading to us. We can now sing from Psalm 139 and verses 1 to 10. O Lord, you have examined me, you know me through and through, my sitting rising all my thoughts afar are known to you. Oh.
like us to sing together, to think together about uh, verse 10 of the chapter that we read from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're told there in verse 10 that we are God's handiwork, <clears throat> created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But especially the uh, first clause there, for we are God's handiwork. There are many descriptions of Christians in the Bible, and some of them are more familiar than others. For example, we are no doubt familiar with the description of them as being sheep. Uh, Jesus is a good shepherd, and all his followers are his sheep. Another uh, description that we might be aware of is that sometimes believers, disciples, are likened to soldiers. They are members of the army of Jesus, and Jesus is their commander, and he helps them as they engage in spiritual warfare. There's a wonderful description of Christians there in Ephesians 2.10, where we read that they are God's handiwork. Uh, the word that is translated as handiwork is the word poema, which is just the word poem with an A at the end of it. Uh, we might think, since it is spelt that way, that it suggests that believers are like a poem, but that wouldn't be the right way to understand it. Rather, the word was used to describe special works of art. Things of attract, that were attractive, that people would put in a position or a place that they would want others to see them. And when we think about that, we can see that when Paul uses this word to describe uh, the followers of Jesus, he is using a very graphic uh, word picture. So I want us to think about uh, this word picture in different ways today. And uh, <clears throat> I would like us to think, first of all, about where did Paul get this idea from? And, of course, that particular question means it's only suggestions that we can make. But sometimes these kind of suggestions can help us appreciate the point that the, the Paul or whoever it is is making. And then every um, work of art at some stage, only was raw material. So what was the raw material that Paul had in mind here? And then every artist has a model. What is the model that Paul had in mind here? And then every artist as tools. What are the tools that God uses? And then every sculptor or artist has a workshop. Where is God's workshop? And then lastly, every artist and sculptor or whatever kind of skillful person it is has a gallery where they show their finished products. And all of them have their parallels in the life of Christians. So I want us to think briefly about us as God's work of art. Where would Paul have got this idea from? 
Well, here are <clears throat> three suggestions. Uh, none of them may be right, but they are three suggestions that do indicate this kind of activity. Uh, two are from the Old Testament, which, of course, was Paul's Bible, and the other one is from the book of Acts. For example, in the Old Testament, God is likened to a potter. And we all know what a potter is. A potter is somebody who takes clay and molds it into something beautiful. And we can easily understand, can't we, how God as a potter can shape our lives. And this, the feature of being a potter is that it's hands-on, isn't it? The, the, the clay is not at a distance. It only works if the potter is, as it were, touching it and controlling it. And that may be one of the sources that Paul has in mind. Another possible one is where he likens God to a metal worker. And he talks about God being like a, a person who gets rid of um, impure uh, aspects of a piece of metal or whatever. And he burns away these impure uh, details, whatever these impure things may happen to be. And that kind of image is not so much hands-on, as it were, but it does point to something uh, very useful for us to remind ourselves about, and that was that the metal worker knew that he had got rid of all the dross when he could see his image perfectly in the metal. And what is God looking for in our lives? He's looking to see himself reduplicated in our characters and so on. So maybe that was another option that Paul used as a background to this figure. A third one, which I would suggest, is found in Acts chapter 19. And in Acts chapter 19, we are told about Paul's visit to Ephesus. And here he is writing to the church in Ephesus. And maybe as he was writing this letter, he recalled what happened when he was in Ephesus. And you may remember that in Ephesus, there was a riot. And the riot was caused by silversmiths who made little models of the goddess Artemis, who was worshipped in Ephesus. The gospel had come to Ephesus and to a pagan community where a great deal of the business activities was connected to the temple, the pagan temple, and one of them was the making of little um, models of the goddess they claimed to worship. Of course, these um, little images, that's all they were. They had no life. They couldn't do anything. The minute someone had purchased one, they knew they had purchased, like everything else that's purchased, it starts to lose value right away. Here's Paul writing to people who knew all about pointless creations. And he's saying to them, unlike these lifeless objects, you are real works of art because the one working in you is the living God, not like what's happening in the temple that kind of dominates your city. 
So maybe he did use that and says to them, these people, silversmiths, they can produce little things that people imagine help them as they serve their goddess. But you, the living God, has made you into something. And I want us to think about that. The raw material that he has. What was the raw material that God had? Well, I mean, Paul talks about it there in the early parts of the chapter in Ephesians chapter 2 and mentions how they were dead in trespasses and sins and things like that. Uh, we're, we're familiar with the notion of a sculptor uh, having this block of stone in front of him. And we might look at the block of stone and say, well, what can he do with that? And at least from my uh, observation at such moments, my uh, anticipation would be he can't do anything with it. It's only a block of stone. But the reality is, I don't have the eyes to see what he can do. And it's the same with us. We there, as Paul says, were dead in our transgressions and, and sins. And it's a very dark picture that he picks of us there. For example, in verse 3, we all did this, that all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. If someone had said to us before we were converted, what can God do with them? Well, the conclusion might have been not very much. Because as raw material, there seemed to be no prospect of anything. But it's not our estimation that matters. The question really is, what does the heavenly artist see? What does the heavenly sculptor see? What can he do with the raw material? And the answer to that question is, make us works of art. The answer is not, make some of us works of art. The answer is, he can make all of us works of art. So the, the raw material, although it's from a human perspective, it looks as if it's got no potential whatsoever. Yet, under the potter's skillful hands, or under the metal worker's cleansing approach, or under the life-giving God's power, any raw material can be transformed. That's good for us who are Christians to look back and see that has happened. It's also good for us as we look out onto our society. Who can change our society? The same divine God who changed us. And what can he make the people of our society, our communities into? He can make all of them into works of art. Each of them bearing his imprint. And therefore that should make us 
confident, optimistic. God did it in Ephesus in the first century. He's done it in our lives, if we're Christians, in the 20th and 21st century. And he can do it in the lives of others walking around our world today, our neighbors, our contacts at work, wherever. The raw material is not a problem. But then there's also, as every sculptor or designer has, there's a model. What is Or should we say, who is God's model? Who does he have in mind every time he sees some raw material? What can he turn that lifeless raw material into? What can it become like? And the amazing answer to that question is, Jesus is his model. If we could go and interview an artist and say, what have you got in mind with this material you have to hand? That artist, he or she might tell us what their intentions were. And that might interest us to know why they were doing what they were doing. If we could interview God and ask him who his model is, it's the same model for everyone. It doesn't matter if they are as raw material, it doesn't matter if they're actually worse than others or if they're better than others. Because after all, Paul here is writing to those who once were religious Jews and others who were once pagan Gentiles. And I suppose from one level, there were degrees of uh, wickedness there. But the degrees of wickedness made no difference in a sense because the model's the same. The model is Jesus. God works to that model all the time. Of course, the Bible tells it in other ways of saying this, that we're going to be conformed to the image of his Son. And that's extraordinary, isn't it? Because Jesus is the best person who ever lived. He's the most beautiful person who ever lived the most attractive person that ever lived. And when God, as it were, begins to work in the lives of sinners, he has nothing but the best in mind for them. He's going to make them all like Jesus. That's something extraordinary. But as the Apostle John tells us, There's a day coming in heaven that when we shall see him, we shall be like him. God will achieve his purpose in making all the subjects of his work into amazing exhibitions of beauty. They'll all be like Jesus. And if you're a Christian today, that is why things are happening to you. It's all part of the process to be like Jesus. The heavenly sculptors at work. And we may wonder what is all the point of something. 
there may be secondary reasons for some things, probably all things, but there's one main purpose for everything, to be like Jesus. That leads us to think a bit about the tools that God uses. There's a whole range of them. He uses the Holy Spirit, doesn't he? And the Holy Spirit specializes in producing beauty. Job reminds us that it was by the Spirit that God garnished the heavens the night sky. That's the work of a real heavenly artist. And that same Holy Spirit works in our lives. He brings us in the first place to Jesus, doesn't he? And he normally does that by letting us see a little glimpse of what's wrong with us. And the little that we see is enough to make us to go to Jesus and to ask for forgiveness. And once a sinner has done that, they are, that same spirit comes to indwell them. And the, the transformation is from the inward out. It's not the other way around. They are renewed inwardly. And this, this renewal process is going on all the time. It's been going on all day to day. We weren't probably even conscious of it, but it's happening. The outward man may be perishing, but the inward man has been renewed. And the Holy Spirit's at work He's one of the tools that the Heavenly Father uses. He also uses the Bible, doesn't he? And the Bible fulfills lots of purposes. It feeds us, gives us spiritual food. It informs us. It guides us. It protects us. It's an amazing tool. And God just uses it. And as we read the Bible, it not only is words on a page, it becomes words in our hearts. And we are changed. And another tool that God uses and is a word that covers everything providence. Everything. Big or small. Not just the big events in our individual lives or the small events in our individual lives, but everything. Our minds can't take that in. But Paul does say that God works it's in the present tense. God works all things for our good. It's all part of the process of becoming works of art. And God is constantly at work. And then there's the workshop. And the workshop is the church. I don't mean the church as a building but the church as the, the living expression of God's kingdom. And into this workshop come visitors just to observe what's going on. In this Ephesians itself, Paul says that in the church, God is teaching the angels things. They are sinless creatures. We might think, what can we teach them? What can they learn from us? 
Well, they might not learn anything from us, but they learn a great deal from what God is doing in us. And they learn about the effects of mercy because they don't experience mercy. They don't need it because they haven't sinned. But everyone in the church gets mercy constantly. Angels come in and marvel at God's grace. Sometimes the world comes in. And often they don't like what they see. And they might take a hold of some of the items under preparation and throw them to the ground. The world comes in to persecute sometimes. Tries to destroy God's work of art. But no matter what they do, it doesn't hinder the process. Even those who are um, crushed for their faith, produce a fragrance and a beauty that's extraordinary. The devil comes into the workshop. He looks round, doesn't he? Sees where each work of art is. came in one day and saw Job and made his assessment and told God the assessment. He said to him, said to God, Job is like that because you've made everything easy for him. Take it away and see what he does. So that happened. What did Job say? In all his confusion and distress, he just said, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The devil's assessment was wrong. One day he came in and saw Peter. And he saw self-confidence on display. And Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And it's going to be tough for you, Peter, because of your self-confidence. But I've prayed for you. And although he fell, even his recovery enhances his beauty. Jesus comes to the workshop, obviously. Is that not what he does when he visits the seven churches of Asia? And just assesses it all and gives his advice and his promises. But the workshop's a great place to be. It's the most incredible location on earth within this workshop at this moment. There are billions and billions of activities going on. And all of them eventually will work together. And all the subjects of the process will be works of art. 
And when that day comes, there'll be a suitable gallery for them. What is the gallery where the works of art will be on display forever? It's a new heavens, a new earth. God will provide a secure and perfect environment Normally the background is needed to enhance the the beauty of the creative ability of the craftsman as he shows his works of art. The background is essential as well. And the same is true for the heavenly craftsman. He's not going to, as it were, put his works of art in, in a place where only a little of their of the outworking of his activity is seen. He's going to put them into a location where the fullness of what he has done in them will be permanently visible. Paul reminds the Thessalonians, doesn't he, that when Jesus returns, he will be admired in them who believe. And since they are all going to be like him, why would we expect otherwise? It's an incredible prospect, isn't it? To be on permanent display in the heavenly gallery. Every gallery that I've been to in this world The objects, no matter how good they are, and no matter how vivid the descriptions are that are made of them, they're still dead. That's all they are. They're objects. But in the heavenly gallery, in the new heavens and new earth, all God's works of art will have fullness of life. And that will be an incredible sight. Because they'll they'll not be static, but they will always be in harmony. It's going to be a world of perfection. And every one of them started out as raw material that no one thought anything could be done with. But God thought differently. And eventually, here are all of them, like Jesus, and like Jesus forever. Amazing prospect, isn't it? Works of art should make a real difference to how we view church. Because all around us are those in whom God is at work. And all around us are those who are going to be in his gallery forever. Extraordinary. But reasons for us to worship him and to live for him day by day. Shall we pray? Lord, we give thanks for your gracious plan. We give thanks for your gracious power that brings it about. We thank you for the amazing prospect that this universe will one day be a gallery in which your Fulfilled plan will be on show forever. Help us, Lord, to anticipate it and to live for it. And if we're not yet Christians, to come to the heavenly craftsman and ask him to remake us. So, Lord, do that, we pray, 
for your own name's sake. Amen. We'll sing from Psalm 63 and verses 1 to 5. O God, you are my God alone. I seek your face with eagerness. My soul and body thirst for you in this dry, weedy wilderness. Lord, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>